All right, so this is part two of my story uh, being in the Fort Lauderdale airport during that shooting that happened recently. Um, you can see the first video by clicking there. Uh, but to catch you up, if you didn't click that, um, I was in Miami for business, had to catch a flight back to Atlanta. I showed up at the airport around the same time as the shooting, just right after it happened. I went through security with no problem. Uh, it didn't seem like a big deal. I saw it on the news, but didn't really, wasn't too concerned about it. I was at my gate, uh, sitting down, uh, FAA canceled all the flights. And then right around that same time, uh, there was a, uh, there was a mass panic that happened in the airport and it's everybody started screaming and running. Uh, and, and I reacted to the screaming and running and I ran down a jet bridge and I jumped onto an airplane and they shut the airplane door behind me. And there was about 10 or 15 of us on the airplane and we were locked in there and we were watching uh, everybody run out of the building from the airplane windows. And so it was pretty crazy. Um, one thing that I want to add is that when the FAA closed the flight, or they suspended the flights, um, we were all talking about the potential of terrorism. So our instincts were heightened like we, we, it wouldn't take much to send us running and it can be debated about what, what happened. The New York times ran an article about the, the, the rumor of a second shooter. And in fact, the TSA even tweeted there was an active shooter in the Fort Lauderdale airport. Um, so the, who. So, we were on the airplane, and we were feeling like it was a terrorism, terrorism attack, terrorist attack. We were looking out the window, seeing everybody run around on the tarmac, and we were feeling like it was a terrorist attack. I had called my dad, I told him what happened, and told him to let everybody know that I was safe for the time being, but that I didn't really know what else was going on. So we were on the airplane for about a half an hour, I think. I didn't have my phone at the time, so it was uh, tough to tell how much time had really passed, but it felt like about half an hour. Um, things had kind of calmed down outside. People were walking around versus running around. Um... It seemed like things were kind of getting it, getting under control. So they made us get off the airplane. There were a few people on the airplane who didn't want to leave. They felt safer on the airplane and they were just, I don't want to leave. I'm sorry. I don't want to leave. But the flight attendants who were there said, I'm sorry, you have to get off the airplane. And so they made us get off the airplane. And we walked down some kind of rickety stairs and we went out and joined the crowds that were already on the tarmac. And we just kind of stood out there. There were hundreds of people, if not thousands, and nobody really had a lot of information. The national news was just oddly not really mentioning the, the second incident that set everybody off. Or the third incident that we had seen that set everybody off on the runway to run. So we were pretty confused as to what was really going on and nobody out there actually had much information. They had already kind of figured out, said there was no second incident, no second shooter, um, nobody shooting inside the airport. And so we were pretty confused as to what really had happened. What really set everybody off? Why did we run? Um, I mean, I know why we ran, but why did what happened that made us react? I guess is the better question. So it was kind of a uh, kind of just one of those things where we were all just kind of in the dark about what really happened. Um, Southwest offered uh, some food and drinks. They had a truck out there that was full of uh, 
drinks and food and it was the one that they used to supply the planes with so that truck would drive around and stock up all the airplanes with fresh pretzels and drinks and so that truck came over and parked um, and they opened it up and they were handing out food and drinks and water and so that was helpful um, there were some porta potties near the construction site that was right there and so people were go able to go to the bathroom so it wasn't all that bad out there on the tarmac. Uh, the temperatures were fine. It did start sprinkling, but it never became more than a sprinkle. Um, there were helicopters everywhere. There were police cars everywhere um, on the access road to get to the airport. You could see, uh, you could see that the interstate was shut down. Um, in the, at the Fort, Lauder, Fort Lauderdale Airport, you can see that the parking garage overlooks the runway. And for a little while there, we could see that the police officers were actually doing sweeps in the parking garage, uh, clearing it, making sure it was safe. And I got to pause because of the stupid air conditioner thing in my house. I think we were out on the runway tarmac area for probably five or six hours. I had borrowed a phone a couple different times to talk to Jen, talk to my parents a little bit, let everybody know I was okay still. Um, and fortunately, the person who had my phone was able to get in touch with my mom. And she did that through the emergency contact information on my phone. So what happened was that when the when everybody started running, and she started running too, she had my phone in her hand and she just didn't let go of it. She just gripped it the whole time. Didn't realize until 10 or 15 minutes later that she even had it with her. Her name was Bree. Her name is Bree. And she uh, called my mom and told my mom that she had her phone. She had my phone. And we, and I got, she gave my mom her phone number my mom gave it to Jen. Jen gave it to me. I wrote it down on a little piece of paper and put it in my back pocket and held on to it. And so I knew my phone was actually okay, but it was going to be pretty difficult to to get it. Um, they had already they she had made her escape out of the airport property, down the railroad tracks, which you might have seen on the news. And uh, she, she found some people who were willing to take her in. She didn't have any of her stuff, her and her friend. And so uh, they made their getaway and they were fine. For us still at the airport, um, it started to get dark. We still didn't have answers. They talked about, uh, we started hearing rumors that there was going to be buses coming to get us and take us somewhere, but we didn't know where. People were still asking if they could go back in the airport, and you know, pretty much that was that was off the table as soon as the airport was evacuated. Which we later found out too was that the rest of the airport had been evacuated too, not just our area. And that brings the weird question of. Um, you know, why did they feel the need to keep searching the airport and if there really wasn't a second shooter? If the, you know, anyway, there's a debate about whether what, what was seen, what was heard. And I don't really, I don't know. I didn't see or hear anything except people screaming and running. So I don't have a whole lot of comment on that other than that it was something, something set people off. So, um, at one point they, they asked, they, the, a bus came and they asked all the witnesses who say they saw something to get on the bus and they took them away to talk to them. And eventually some buses came for more people and they started putting people on the buses. There were a lot of old people. There were a lot of people in wheelchairs, um, People were had been standing for so long and out in the elements for so long, and it, it was just people were exhausted. So um, several busloads of people left. It was starting to be fewer and fewer people, 
And then some of the uh, law enforcement people uh, started saying, if you have local people or a local place to stay or a car parked at the airport, then get in this line. We will actually escort you through the airport from the back to the front and lead you out to the front where you can get on a bus. I don't understand what the difference was, but I, I knew that if I could get through, if I could go back through the airport, I had a chance of getting my two bags. So I jumped to the kind of the front of the line and I just kind of was like, I'm going to give it my best shot. And sure enough, we actually came in a door about 20 feet from where my bags were. And I, when we were coming up the stairs into the second floor of the airport, I asked the guy who was standing at the door guarding it, I said, if I am close enough to grab my bag, can I do that? And he said, yes. So as soon as I got through that door, I ran over to the where I had been sitting. My bags were, sh were about five feet apart from each other. Somebody had tripped over, um, tripped over them and they were spread out, but I was able to get both of them. I picked them up and I jumped back in line. The rest of the airport, when we came in, there were people audible gasps as to what the state of the airport was. It was, it was just, everybody had just left just like that. Um, it was almost like the, uh, the rapture, like everybody just disappeared. Bags, drinks spilled, food spilled, phones sitting everywhere, phones plugged into the wall, um, bags and shoes and some clothes. It was, it was a very weird feeling to be in this airport and just see the chaos just strewn about. Everybody's just belongings, personal belongings just spread out everywhere. Right after I got my things, um, they got on the loudspeaker in the airport and they said, um, do not film anything. This is being treated as a crime scene. If you take photos or you film anything and we catch you, we will confiscate your phone. We will confiscate your camera. So I didn't take out my camera, of course. And... Uh, they said, don't touch anything. Don't touch your bags. Don't get your bags. We've hired a third party company that's going to come in and clean all this up and get you back your bags, but don't touch anything. By that point, I had already grabbed my bags and I didn't seem to be in trouble. So I just kept my mouth shut and I walked out with my bags. They walked us out through the airport, out to the front. There were hundreds of people, thousands of people out there. I mean, thousands really. And they were all waiting for buses. And so I stood in the line to get on a bus for about an hour. And then I was able to get on a bus, but it was like a subway, like a packed New York City subway. And it's like when it's too full and people are just kind of squeezed in there and it's, it's and people's luggage was in there and it was it was jammed. Everybody was desperate to get on the bus, and so it was a little over full. But I was on there, and we started driving. Um, we drove around through the other terminals, and I pulled out my camera, and I got some footage um, of how many people were waiting in line for the buses, and it's thousands. And so as you can see right now, you can see the, the thousands and thousands of people just waiting on these buses. Um, the bus was... Uh, was pretty much caught in a traffic jam in no time at all. We The port that they were taking us to, Port Everglades, was about a mile from the airport. And it, we were on that bus for probably an hour to an hour and a half. And after standing on the runway for so long and standing on the bus for so long, standing in line for the bus for so long, my feet were killing me. Oh, plus I had been shooting at a conference, and so I had been standing for the last three days, and I was my feet were just killing me, and I was so tired of standing up. The people, passengers were starting to get frustrated and upset, and they said, let us off the bus, let us off the bus. We hadn't moved but like five inches in 30 minutes. 
And so, uh, so finally the bus driver opened the doors and let us off the bus. And I, I got off the bus and I started walking. I had, I had my two bags with me, my camera bag and my laptop bag. And I just started walking and it was, we were outside the, out, we were kind of on the far side of the, the Port Everglades and I didn't really know where to go. There was people walking and I kind of followed them for a little while, but I saw, I saw another way that maybe I wanted to go, and so I went that way, um, and I was looking to go to the convention center, uh, but it was all locked up, and nobody just locked up, and I couldn't go in. So I went around to the other side of the building, and I was pretty much, soon I was by myself just walking, and I came around the corner, and I saw a Hilton hotel that was off in the distance, and I said, you know, I was like, if I can get to that hotel, then I'll be I'll, I'll be able to uh, be picked up by Jen's parents because I didn't have a phone. So I so even if I got to where everyone else was, they would still have a really tough time picking me up. And I knew that there was a big traffic jam, and so I knew it'd be hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours before Jen's parents could even get to me and pick me up. But if I could get to that hotel, maybe it wasn't nearly as crowded, and I could just say I'm at the Hilton. And you can come pick me up there. So uh, I walked for a mile and I got to the Hilton. And I went to the bar. And I got some ice water. And a uh, and a snack. It was a, a, a Reese's peanut butter cup. And I sat down in the lobby. And it was air conditioned. And I just relaxed for a minute. And then I called Jen's parents from the concierge phone and they came to get me. And I made a little, while I was in the hotel, I pulled out the camera again and I filmed just a little bit. Um, I didn't feel like talking. I just felt like resting, but I made a few thoughts. I'm just tired. Luckily I've got a ride coming to get me. Jen's mom and dad are coming. They live near here in Fort Lauderdale. They live in Boca. So they were able to come, and uh, I made it to this hotel. <clears throat> They're full, but I don't need a night. I just needed to get some air conditioning and a drink, and a snack, and a place to rest. I don't have my phone. I'm gonna try and meet up with the person who does have it, and that's part of the story that I'll tell you. I've gone through this whole thing without a phone, so. Um, more on that later, but right now I just wanted to, uh, mostly I just wanted to sit down. My feet hurt, and I wanted to sit down, get a drink, get a snack, and I'll tell you the rest later. So once they came to get me, uh, they brought me a sandwich, they brought me some food and drinks, and they took me to their house, and um, I was able to use their her, her mom's phone to talk to people, talk to Jen, talk to my parents. Um, I got to their house and I was able to get on the internet. Um, and it just, it felt a million times better. But I, I still was like super tired. And so I went to bed and slept very well. The next day, um, I, I got online to see what the options were for getting my checked baggage back. I had two bags that were checked. So they said, go to the airport, you can get your bags back. So I also called Bree, who had my phone, and found out she was at the airport also. And so that was perfect, and I met her up with her at the airport, and I got my phone back. I also wait, like put my name in on the list of what I was there looking for my luggage. And eventually, after a long time, I got my regular suitcase back, my clothes. Look what I got. I got one. I got, I got one. got the badge with the, with the tag. From where? This yeah. one's mine. Oh, this is yours? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're one. One. Yes. But that's good news. No, right here. There. No, oh, no, there. I don't know. Okay. Wait, it was okay. here. I just grabbed it. Is that okay? So dish. That's yep. one. Yep. Okay. But not the not the tripod that I had with me. 
that and it just seemed like that wasn't they like the the bag searching and hooking people up with their bags just kind of came to a, a stop and and I left the airport again I was there for four or five hours so meanwhile how do I get back to Atlanta my boss um, was awesome hooked me up with a new airline ticket uh, first class seating and on the first flight that was available back to Atlanta which was on Sunday on Facebook everybody said that they that there was a lot of comments there was a lot of texts to me uh, people were uh, when I got back to work people hugged me and it was just nice to know that people cared so anybody who's watching this I appreciate you I appreciate you caring there's a much bigger discussion to be had about terrorism and about gun control and gun violence and I don't really know where and how to approach that conversation but this this video is not it the comment section here is not it but it's important conversations to be had somewhere somehow this whole thing was just you know I wanted to share what I had been through um, there was no real other motivation for that uh, there's no other motivations for these videos um, it was a it was a scary situation and I just wanted to share what I've been through so I appreciate you watching and uh, hopefully the next videos I post will be a lot more upbeat and exciting <laughs> till next time Thank you.